I have 6.30 now, so I'm going to start the webinar. Do we open the system? What's up? Open the system? Yes. Okay. okay. Yeah. And you're, yeah. Yes, you're. Six. Are you with the not with community board community yeah. member? That's lovely. Yeah. <laughs> we're so happy to have you. Great. All right. So we're going to get started. Um, folks are still joining virtually, and I know some people are still walking in, which is great. Um, I'm Katie Walsh. I'm the chair of the transportation committee. Um, John DeLuper is vice chair. We have three agenda items um, before we get to roll call. Um, so just to say that we have a presentation, Jessica Cruz is here from the New York City Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice, and we'll be speaking on a variety of topics that relate to transportation and last mile trucking issues. Then we will have public comment. If uh, there are folks who have public comment, when we get to that point, you can put your hand up virtually. If you're in the room, we will make sure you get recognized. And then uh, we'll have a committee discussion on Third Avenue and the BQE proposals. Thank you if you had a chance to go through them and look at them. We um, do have printed copies at the front. So if you didn't get to look through them again, um, if you participated in person or virtually for those. And we will, uh, when we get to the committee discussion, we will actually be taking a few minutes and 
within this room in person and then also virtually giving committee members a few minutes in small groups to talk amongst themselves. I do know that we have some agency reps that are here. Um, I would, you can stay, but I would say like what we're trying to do is facilitate conversation among committee members um, when we get to that point on the agenda. Um, and that's the, the last item. Um, and uh, with that, I will turn to um, Jeremy and we'll do roll call. And if you're in the room, don't hesitate to help yourself at any point to any of the snacks in the back. Thanks. Good evening, everyone. Committee members, when I call your name, uh, please, uh, if you're here, uh, acknowledge. If you are joining us by Zoom, please unmute, acknowledge, and then remember to mute yourself again. If you are joining us by Zoom, you do not count towards the quorum. Let's start with Katie Walsh. Thank you. John DeLuper. Present. Thank you. Damian Andrade. Andrade, excuse me. Thank you. Joan Body. Thank you. Jerry Chan. Present. Thank you. Gabina Morales Escamilla. Thank you. Zachary Jacy. Daniel Kaminsky. Angie Lau. Angie, you could unmute yourself. Oh, yes, I'm here. You. Angie, you don't count towards the quorum. Roberto Martinez. Thank you. Marilyn Melman. Jamie Nelson. Sam Sierra. Cindy Vandenbosch. Here. Thank you, Cindy. You don't count towards the quorum. Julio Pena the third. Present. Thank you, Julio. You don't count towards the quorum. Roll has been called. Much. Um, so why don't we um uh, invite a rep up from the mayor's office of climate and environmental justice? It'd be about a 10-minute presentation, and then we'll take time for questions. So um can you have the We have the presentation. Oh, yeah, I don't know. Well, I don't know. How do you want to do it? I forwarded it. Yeah, you did. Are you sure? It's not set up yet. Oh, yeah, please. I haven't emailed the electronic version of this presentation to everybody yet, but we'll make sure that it goes out to, to the board and all the committee members tomorrow. So maybe I'll give two seconds of, of context as Jeremy is, is picking that um, back up. Um, as we have all been on this quest to improve transportation, air quality, um, safety, accessibility, environmental justice issues in this community for a very long time and been on the record. Um, we've been seeking out and trying to work with as many agencies, both at the city and the state level as we can. Um, and so as we've done this engagement, of course, with the city department of transportation, um, it has also been and department of city planning around issues of last mile trucking. What came out of that discussion was engaging the mayor's office of climate and environmental justice. So um, through someone who had participated with us before through the community board, um, brought us to brought Jessica to us um, to do this presentation specifically on all of the ways that the mayor's office is working on these larger issues. So, yeah. Uh, okay. So my name is Jessica Cruz. I'm the deputy director for Living Streets and Public Spaces, the Mayor's Office of Climate and Environmental Justice. Closer. <laughs> Thank you. Um, so my team focuses on extreme heat, air quality, transportation, waste management, and green infrastructure. Um, and then, so we'll go to the next slide for the agenda. So I'll review a little bit about us, our office, and then I'll share some of the transportation 
initiatives from our plan YC and our energy uh, plan. And then I will just do a QA. and a um, I'm hoping that this is a bit of an initial conversation in terms of just like how, what are the issues that are a concern for CB7 and then what are ways that our office can really start to engage. Uh, my background is in planning and transportation. I grew up in an environmental justice community in Los Angeles where air quality was bad, where traffic was bad. So definitely those kind of issues really sit close to home for me. Um, so, okay, so our office, has kind of existed in this iteration in the last year when Mayor Adams came into office, he merged our resiliency and sustainability office. Um, so we really focus on making New York City more green, more sustainable, more safe. And we try to do this through a comprehensive approach. So we know that changes that need to happen are not just policy, but it's infrastructure. It's like programs that help improve the lives of New Yorkers. So I'll give an example uh, on our work on extreme heat, for example. So we, with extreme heat, we know that we need good data to show us what New Yorkers are really struggling with heat, for example. Um, we know that we need to provide better access to AC units. We know that we need to provide better utility uh, assistance. And we know that we need to find ways of cooling our environment through tree canopy, through better infrastructure. So this is kind of the approach that we take with all the different policy areas uh, in our kind of repertoire. Um, sorry, yeah, we can go to context. Perfect. Yeah, so our office is tasked through legislation with creating a couple of different plans. So the first big one is Plan YC. Uh, so that's our climate strategic plan. And then including our, and then the other two are energy, like our energy report and then we're releasing our, the first ever kind of environmental justice report next year. So we'll go to the next one. Yep. Uh, so some of the issues that we kind of talk about as an office and we deal with as an office are extreme heat, flooding, buildings, energy. And these are things like we're trying to pass a maximum indoor temperature, things like we're trying to make buildings more energy efficient. Uh, we're trying to deal with areas that deal with a lot of flooding. Go to the next one. Uh, we also deal with the green economy. So how are we dealing with jobs in terms of just like as the energy kind of environment is changing, as we're seeing a need for more training around electrification and just a need for more jobs. And we also deal with waste and circular economy, so just composting, things of that nature. Go to the next one. Uh, open space, waterways, transportation, and food. So those are like the big initiatives as well. So just creating better access to open spaces, better connectivity uh, through open spaces. How are we kind of connecting parks? How are we connecting to like greenways and things of that nature? Waterways, how are we better activating our maritime essentially to make sure that we're starting to remove some of the trucks uh, from our roads? Transportation, again, dealing with air quality, more electrification, and just like how do we start to create like a mood shift? And then the last one is food. So go to the next one. So Plan YC. So the first, one of the big initiatives that we included in Plan YC was the first low emission zone uh, in New York City. Excuse me, we're looking at doing this a couple of different ways. We're like in the early, early stages of figuring out what the next step is gonna be. So we know that there's the Clean Deliveries Act that I think you're all familiar with or have had a presentation on. So we're looking to see if we can support that. We're looking to see if we should create our own local indirect source rule, um, or if just there are other ways of creating like zones where we can kind of find trucks in terms of like having, making sure that the trucks that are entering certain zones are electric. Go to the next one. looking to end unlawful truck idling. So we know that there's a complaint program. So we're looking to see if we can reform uh, certain laws and regulations that exist today so that we can make sure that this, uh, there's, uh, so we can completely end truck idling by 2024. The next one. And then create shared charging depots by 2030. So we know that there's overall like a need for more space. There's a big movement towards electrification as a way of just 
trying to create better air quality and just like change the way that we let movements move around the city. We know there's a big influx of e-commerce, a lot of last mile facilities. So how are we starting to change not only the movement of these trucks, but also again, like making sure that the trucks that are kind of moving through the city are electric. Next one. Uh, we're also looking at the adoption of cargo bikes. Uh, so for example, we know that this isn't the, like the only solution that exists when it comes to reducing and improving, sorry, air quality, but it is like one solution that like other, some of the agencies are looking at in terms of just like, can we move goods through things like smaller vehicles and cargo bikes? The next one. And then the other one is using more of the maritime, right? Using our marine highway, we just released an RFEIs uh, to try to see what are ways that we can kind of better encourage and like require companies, private companies to move goods through again, like barges, the waterfront, and reduce kind of the number of trucks that are moving through the city. <laughs> that is correct. Uh, our next plan that we released in September is Power Up. So that's our energy plan uh, that focuses on clean energy, electrification, and then just a reduction of emission goals. Um, this, the kind of the, the three initiatives that I'll talk about in that are, if we can go to the next one. Uh, the view, so we're starting uh, with Nice Bus, which is like a nonprofit that kind of partners the Department of Education, starting a pilot uh, to look at how we can kind of start to do this vehicle to grid. Uh, pilot and what are kind of some of the things that we can learn from that program and we can implement that with other fleets and other uh, companies. And then the last two are launch a training program on for electric school bus operations and maintenance and provide ongoing support. So really, again, how are we starting to look at workforce? How are we looking at how the industry is starting to shift? and then just ways that we can make sure that we're providing access to jobs and some training. And then the last one is electrify on-road freight movement. So then again, this is just making better requirements, looking for funding for a lot of these private companies to make sure that they are electrifying. And we've set some pretty like big goals around electrification overall. Um, so that's, the presentation, happy to open up for questions. Um, I don't know if I'm gonna have all the answers that you're looking for today. Really looking, again, like we'll definitely come back and loop back and anything that I'm not able to answer today. Great, thank you. I, um, I do have a few questions, but I also know that you uh, you pulled in some other folks, some other agencies. Do you wanna recognize them in the room so that people know who they are? Yeah, so I'll allow, I'll allow Juki and like Emily if you wanna introduce yourselves. I apologize. Are we supposed to have mics for people who are speaking in the room or does it pick up in the, okay. Um, you'll be the mic usher. Okay. Thank you. Just, um, yeah, if you can just repeat it one more time. Thank you. Hello. Hi everyone. Good to be back. I think I saw some of you last week or two weeks ago for the zoning for economic opportunity presentation. Either way, my name is Juki. I work for the Department of City Planning in the Brooklyn Borough Office. I'm the liaison for Community Board 7, Sunset Park, as well as Community Board 16, Brownsville Ocean Hill. Thanks. Hi, my name is Emily Rikama. Um, I'm the Community Liaison to 7 um, at the Brooklyn Borough Commissioner's Office at DOT. Okay, um, so we'll open up to a couple questions. Uh, I have, I'll just start with one and then Jeremy and um, then we'll open up to any committee members, the public. Um, so 
as you know well, uh, last mile trucking facilities and trucking in general um, is a major concern issue here. Um, you did talk about the, the first point was around a low emission zone. Um, Community Board 7, actually, we had created and ran for about two and a half years a special committee just on last mile trucking. And we had a presentation in 2021 from the city of Santa Monica who had a low emission zone. Folks will remember that, Santa Monica, California. Um, but that a low emission zone was just focused on the delivery. So it was it was what was happening for the delivery of um, goods and services, whereas Community Board 7, uh, Sunset Park, Red Hook were the point of origination where a lot of these facilities are. Um, and so can you just talk about this low emission zone that you're considering? Is it, you know, on the delivery end, say like, communities like what we've seen, uh, these hubs are serving Williamsburg or Park Slope, right? Are you looking at communities where they're delivering goods um, or are you looking at point of origination? It'll depend where, like which uh, pathway we choose. So if we decide to do a zone, uh, we were initially looking at places like Sunset Park, Red Hook, uh, Hunts Point, places where we know there's already a lot of like truck traffic um if we go the route of the the indirect source rule so that'll be a little different right that'll just be like requiring warehouses or companies right that have a movement of goods to essentially start to become more green essentially and reduce their emissions so it, it'll depend which way we go and and then so there's opportunity at the local level if we go that route or if we we know that the clean deliveries act is also trying to move at the state level so that's another opportunity where we would see some of that impact Excuse me. I have a couple of questions. First, um, I didn't hear anything about the sanitation department, which by law has to have uh, uh, an electric fleet by 2040, I believe. Is there anything in the plan about uh, preparing the sanitation garages to uh, handle the new vehicles? Uh, my understanding is additional space is going to be needed. Um, but our current garages might not have the capacity for that. So is the city looking at um, finding new facilities within the communities uh, for new sanitation garages to handle the, the new trucks? I, so I think with electrification spaces, one of the big issues, we're seeing that not just with sanitation, but just a lot of essentially any fleet company, right, that has a lot of like trucks or a lot of agencies themselves. So I think we're we're exploring like solutions that would allow more of like mobile charging. So can we move around like bring again battery storage to some of these like places or just like mobile charging that would allow kind of the like more flexibility when it comes to space. So there's some of the the ways that we're approaching it. And then uh, the other thing I want I brought this up to EDC last week and they didn't have an answer, but uh, I'm all for. Uh, more electric vehicles and electrifying buildings, but where are we getting the power? Um, we just recently learned that the two peaker power plants in this community that were supposed to be shut down in 20, decommissioned in 2025, their life has now been extended. Those are some of the oldest and dirtiest facilities in New York City, and it seems like this community is going to get dirtier air while other uh, communities get cleaner. How is that going to be mitigated in the local community? But we're looking again like at better ways that we can either use facilities or manufacturing zones as a possible way of creating more local storage battery storage again to kind of help mitigate some of that like peaker plant um, usage overall. I know the city is looking at other sources of energy, things like like solar for for example is a big one that we're trying to move forward, and then some offshore wind options. Um, but, but how soon will that, how many additional megawatts is the city going to need, actually? I, that I don't know off the top of my head. Yeah, I can definitely have an answer for you. Mm -hmm. um, do we have any questions from committee members or from the public? I see Joan maybe motioning and then Jerry, and then I can, again, can be um, and we'll just pass you the mic, Jerry, and then Gambino, I think you had your hand up. Okay. The very, very big issue in our community, both Sunset Park and Windsor Terrace, is finding available places 
to build a school. No, no. And if we want to build, and oh, we have to, and it should be, BK7 should be in, the, in our local area. Ours is not that close to us. We have to think where we're going to build, being that we have absolutely no place. priority yeah, I, I think that's a that's one of the tough questions right that we deal with as a city is this the there's limited space what are ways that we can think differently um but also making understanding right that like climate and environmental just doesn't always take the forefront right sometimes there are things like education housing that are at the forefront of what communities need so we're often looking for a balance between all those things down here on first avenue where the turbines are being installed. Is it absolutely possible to landfill? Because I see a lot, an awful lot of concrete and, and, and debris in, in, in the ocean close to the, sh close to the shore. I don't have an answer when it comes oh, to that. Uh, could it possibly be done? I think it's a possibility. I don't have the, the the answer for you for that, but I can definitely like ask for sure. And I don't know if maybe no. And a, 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 another area. <laughs> Do you mind? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. Air rights over our the N line and the B line. That is something that the school construction committee had wanted years ago and we were told it's too expensive. So that's also a possibility to keep in the back of your mind. Thank you. I appreciate that. So I want to follow up on Jeremy's question. I think it's a question out of my book. So follow up on the um, um, fleet that need to be upgraded to EV, right? We're not just talking about sanitation, we're talking about DOT, right? We're talking about uh, FDNY, NYPD and stuff. Uh, uh, how is a city is going to come up with money right, to replace all those trucks and does not impact by us, by and I and I ask my second question after. That. Uh, so we that the our look so the way that we're funding a lot of the electrification is through money through the federal government. The federal government is really providing a lot of money right now when it comes to electrification. So and then I would say things like the public service commission, right? They're providing a lot of funding for medium heavy duty vehicles. And then in terms of our, our own city fleet, we feel like we're pretty on a pretty good pathway in terms of reaching our electrification goals. Um, as was mentioned, I think the harder kind of trucks that we'll, we're struggling to electrify because at this point, it doesn't seem like the technologies there are those trucks in terms of like trucks that can kind of deal with the colder winter, right? I think that's like we, unlike other places like California where it's like warmer, uh, we have to deal with the changes in season, so that kind of impacts our approach in terms of electrification. But that, but we are very much again like making good progress, and we've seen a lot of changes and and are are shifting our our fleets. And I don't know if DOT has anything else to add. Maybe not. No. I just want to was part of the question just like cost to the taxpayers of electrifying. Um, which, you know, I think it's a great question. The thing I wanted to just piggyback on what Jessica was saying is I pulled it up because I, I feel like I'd seen some stats, but I think the city already has around 2,000, I want to say, I'm looking at, it's like 2,260 electric vehicles that have been phased in over the past years. And obviously, I think, you know, of course, there's major concerns about cost, 
but I think a lot of it is like already happening and we're moving on it. Um, but it's something that I think it's like replacement of old vehicles and sort of the the idea of like the purchasing we need to do has to be green and we all understand that. But I think it's a great question. Thank you. So for our question, right, about the power grid. Sunset Park is known for uh, blackout, burnout, however you call it, because it, 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 be some, it, it does that. So how is the city uh, is going to prevent that from happening? I don't have an answer for you. I know our, our energy team focuses on that, so but I don't have an on answer for you at the top of my mind. But I can look back and I will I can definitely bring it back. It does happen in this neighborhood. And yeah. I do agree with you. The city is replacing all the, the fleet vehicle that NYPD use and the city use with a EV car. But like you say, truck, the bigger truck, the technology is not there yet. Right. That's why the 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 um whatever that Tesla truck is not coming out yet because there's so many problems. And we're also looking at things like battery repowering, right? So like, can you convert things like buses into electric vehicles and not essentially have to buy a new vehicle that's a at a lower cost? So that's another approach that we're looking at. Thank you. So my last question, I'll pass it on, is about air quality, right? So with the congestion pricing coming up soon, right, everyone will... will dump their vehicle or idle their vehicle here in Sunset Park before they, they, they or take the train to your city. Have the city did a study in this area, the impact in this area with the congestion pricing. We are, for example, which we got truck coming in, in and out. We got cars coming in and out. We have cars will come in here to bypass the extra fee, a fee that they go pay. I don't have an answer for you on that right bring now. Back. But I will bring it back unless no. And uh, Gambino had his hand up, and then Sam, we can come back to you, back to you. Um, and this the congestion pricing question. I know um, Jerry has brought this up a couple of times about the impact that it's going to have, particularly communities like you know proximity wise, like ours. So I do think between your agency and then MTA, Jerry, I think is the other. I mean, that's the agency that we need to also follow up with directly. Um, so we can do that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you very much. I am Gabino Morales on the Transportation Committee as well. Uh, I do want to piggyback, pig, piggyback on um, Jerry's uh, statement about the congestion pricing. It is going to affect a lot of families, a lot of businesses, everything that's going to happen here in our community and extend beyond what's going to happen for New York City and New York State the state in total. But uh, this is just the first thing I wanted to say. For the congestion pricing, please, uh, if you guys could bring this up to anybody that could say that um, we have some exemptions for some people, maybe we could go forward with that uh, congestion pricing, but not fully in total. Because there's business businesses that have to be intact, families that have to be put together. It starts with the businesses and family businesses. The only people who are going to be affected by this congestion pricing is going to be the middle class. It's not going to be the corporations, the big uh, people who make money and stuff like that. They could, they have enough money to pay for everything. They have enough. They don't care about that. But yeah, I just want to pick it back on him. You know, make sure uh, people bring our concerns, our concerns, please, towards uh our mayor approve somebody's gonna approve that legislation. Make sure they know what they're doing. make sure they know what they're doing, make sure they're thinking they're thinking. And second please that putting up. Yeah, I will definitely like our office deals with congestion pricing, right? But it's not the, the office that's leading congestion pricing. So can definitely come back. Then we, our office has a, has a requirement as well that whenever we receive questions from the community, we have a certain amount of time that we have to respond. So I, I definitely will bring back like the answers to these questions um, in the next kind of- All, Do all city agencies have that requirement or is that just the mayor's office? I don't know. If, I, I don't know if every city, I, I know we do, yeah. Okay. And thank you. Uh, yeah, definitely. I just want to put that out there uh, besides Something else. 
for the days. Yes, sir. Thank you. That's all right. It's all right. But like I was saying, um, we do want. Oh shit! Oh snap! I mean, <laughs> sorry. This is yes. <laughs> Uh, like I wanted to say about our community, we are protecting our community, people, workers, the middle class, especially want to make sure everybody's okay. And for the, can I talk about the BQE? This is what's going on. For the BQE, um, I did read through all the proposals, every design, whatever they're trying to do. Um, and from, from top to bottom, every issue that we have over here, we hope it gets resolved. But if not, if it doesn't get resolved, we understand. It's always been like that for the DOT. You know, they try to mitigate the first instance that they want to see. The easiest stuff that they could fix. And um, we want not the easiest stuff to get fixed. It's the hardest, the hardest things that we need to get fixed in our community. We need to get that fixed. Um, so for Third Avenue, there's going to be a lot of projects, a lot of things that you have to see before you guys implement, whatever you guys are going to implement on 3rd Avenue, please make sure every instance, for every correction you guys have to make, please, for the most, make sure our community is safe. We're trying to make our community safer. There's been deaths. There's been deaths. I'm going to be testimony for that. There's been deaths in our community. Death where people have died because the Department of Transportation has not been doing their job. And you know we try to do our job to communicate that with Department of Transportation, but if they don't want to listen to us, then we're gonna we're gonna have to just keep piling up the deaths, right? You guys want that? No, please make sure you guys fix everything you guys see on that list. What we gotta fix? Please try to implement that. Please, Department of Transportation, implement that. It's the safety of our community. Of our community. It's the safety of the nation. The safety of everybody involved. We have kids, families, uh, kids, uh, mothers, childs. I can't even speak no more because it's taking a toll on our community. Please get that fixed. Make sure you guys read every um dots, every every dot that you guys gotta read and fix. Please fix it on Third Avenue. Third Avenue between Twenty Fourth Street to Sixty Fourth Street and beyond. Okay. Thank you very much. Um, okay, we do have a couple of uh, questions that are coming in online, and then I know there were some more people in the room. I do also want to acknowledge that we have a, another poll, two agenda items. We have public comment, and then we have BQE and Third Avenue proposal. Um, but let's still take time for questions. So maybe we'll go virtual to one question, and then we'll come back to in the room. Cindy Vandenbosch. Yeah, um, I just have a quick question, which is, um, I know I, I'm I'm in support of of these efforts, um, but I'm wondering in your planning process how much you're engaging actual sort of industrial businesses in these districts in in the in the process of sort of thinking about electrification of trucks and deliveries, so that they're a part of this process as well, um, so that it's something that's like can practically be implemented. Um, and so I'm just wondering how you're thinking about that um, for the, as, as you sort of put together or start thinking about a pilot um, for this particular project for the, um, for the, the final mile trucking. Yeah, um, I guess one example of where we're engaging kind of private fleets is through our school bus electrification work. So that's kind of really showing us some of the limitations uh, that vendors and again, fleets are facing when it comes to electrification. So we're really trying to understand beyond space uh, restrictions, what are other areas where we really need to start thinking through funding, training, and those aspects. So we're working uh, with, for example, like MTA and the Bronx Community College to kind of create new programs around training for these jobs but also through things like the Public Service Commission and their funding requirements, really understanding uh, how, again, fleets are facing this electrification and what they're struggling to do. I, I guess my question, if you're going to pilot in like an industrial zone and 
would it have an impact on industrial businesses and would you work with them it like would you work with them and you know as part of that pilot in order to I, I understand like you're working with um vehicles that the city has or or contracts with the city, but I'm I'm just wondering if if you'll be involving actual businesses in the district if you introduce something like this that affects private businesses. I don't have a an existing plan for that, but at some point we would need to. So I would say at this point we don't. Um but what plan to? Okay, thank you. Go back to the in the room, Sam, and then Damien. Um, and I guess we will try this again and see. Great. Okay, great. So hi, good evening. My name is Samuel Sierra, a transportation committee member. I just had a uh, clarification with regard to the overview, and depending on the answer, I then have a question regarding the the uh, um, electric school buses. And I'm sorry that I came a few minutes late, but this overview that we're going over is specific to community board seven, yes? It's, it's honestly, it's the, the work that we're doing at the citywide level. So there are things in there that are about our, you know, I know there are buses in like, uh, some depots in like Red Hook, but it's not, I know there's no bus depots in- That's that was going to be my question is um, the states that they're going to try. We have a massive, yeah, it's the Jackie Gleason Depot. Yeah, that, that they're going to <laughs> try to deploy 50 electric buses in the upcoming 2023, I mean, 2023, 2024 school year. I wanted to ask what is the number of the fleet? And also, is there a timeline thereafter? We we, uh, we do the 50. Yeah, the school bus fleet is 10,000 buses total throughout the city. Uh, the goal is electrification by 2035. No problem. To clarify, the only bus fleet that you're working on is the DOE school buses, not any private school buses or anything like that, because I know we also have a lot of those too. What do you mean by so the DO right the DOE contracts are we talking about the contractors that provide the fleet to DOE or yes that's There's a lot of independent with. smaller ones yeah yeah those are those are the the ten thousand uh, overall mm -hmm. thank you so much for coming out tonight I guess to go back on the plan and YC getting sustainable done. There's the cargo bikes that you talked about, like the pilot program. I'm all for it. I guess like when do you expect us as community board seven to receive it? Because the only way I have seen or the way I only seen these cargo bikes is it's only in the city. And it's kind of for me crazy that when we do these pilot programs, we only do these pilot programs in wealthier neighborhoods. But when when we really want to see the data work, I feel like that those stuff should become to like communities like us that really desperately needs those because by the time like the it, it just says here by like 2026 and I'm like but we don't really have the time like that like people are still suffering from um respiratory illnesses due to these trucks so I guess like when is your estimate when a lot of these pilot programs will come to communities like ours OT has a better answer on cargo bikes and the rollout Just quickly on cargo bikes, what is the capacity of a cargo bike versus a small truck or other vehicle? And would that require a lot more uh, employees to deliver goods? Yeah, I mean, cargo, I, I don't know the specific difference between the two, but cargo bikes, of course, would carry less, right? And that's why we're looking at cargo bikes and some smaller vehicles. And that's why we're also trying to push the maritime aspect, because we know there's a lot of trucks, right? And it's not all going to get resolved with with cargo bikes, but it is one one approach. Um, I guess my second question will be, um, there was like a section with the waterways, and it said that EDC is planning to build like six. Do you know like an estimate of when like public comment and et cetera will start coming to 
community board 07 to see where exactly these ports will be implemented at? I don't know about public comment. I believe the six places that they're targeting include either Red Hook, I believe is one of them, and then Hunts Point is another, but I don't have the, the specifics. And I can look back and make sure that I give you the right answer. Okay, do we have any more questions online? I see uh, another two in the room, but I just wanna, no other, no other hands in the room. Okay, um, Sam and then Gambito and then we'll, okay. wanted to point out that with regard to the uh, getting the electric buses um, or fully electric between uh, now and 2035 is, uh, I just wanted to share that's quite ambitious. Um, we're looking at like 83 buses per year if we're going to be fully, um, have a fully electronic fleet and we're starting off this year with just 50. So I, I just wanted to point out it's quite ambitious. And uh, I just wanted to point those numbers out. Yeah. Thank you so much. I, I would agree with that statement. Anyone else in the room has questions? If you can just queue up um, so you can go up to the front. Go ahead. Thank you, Gambino. Uh, I'm, uh, okay. Again, uh, Gambino Morales on the Transportation Committee as well. Uh, I just wanted to reiterate uh, for the national, what's going on nationally and internationally. Uh, since we're going to electrify everything that's gonna happen by 2035, like I've been saying since the beginning of the time, we wanna make sure we have something that backs up the electri electrifying uh, aspect of our um, community. So if we get attacked by any foreign nation or whatever is going on, we make sure we have a hybrid system or make sure we uh, um, just uh, secure our, our infrastructure, okay? Uh, I keep bring this, bringing this up towards the um, community for uh, 2035. We're going to go 100% electrifying, you know, our community. But make sure we have our systems back up just in case we need to go up against uh, any any foreign or anything that's going to happen for our nation. We got to protect our nation, please. Okay. And this is just um, something serious. Because uh, we gotta electrify everything, and um, what does that mean? What does that mean? Can we go hybrid? Can we go up uh for systems that could protect each and every one of us as an individual, and just not just for electrifying our systems? It goes beyond that. It's just what I'm talking about right now: electrifying our our system. But uh, protecting our electric electrification. Thank you so much, Gambino. Bye. Okay. Thank you. Can I can I please uh, continue for a uh, hybrid? Uh, it could be hybrid, better than just electrifying. If any other country tries to attack attack us, it's gonna be just devastating. Um, so I'm bringing this up. This is a true commitment to our country that we need to protect. Please, we, we're moving towards 100% electrifying our community systems. But please, let's have a hybrid system or some type of system that we protect if from other, any other foreign countries. And that's all I got to say. OK, go to the last question in the room. Hi, um, I just had a question. I think it's great to see these uh, initiatives and also really exciting to see it alongside the redesign for Third Avenue. I think my question is, um, and excuse me if this has been talked about earlier, but I, I'd love to hear more about how this relates to the truck routes um, and understand if the design and these initiatives, I know we're talking about low emission zones, but I just want to understand how that factors into the existing truck routes or looking at new truck routes. I think that there's a a really interesting and um, challenging issue right now, especially on the other side of Third Avenue um, with the development of the Made in New York campus with potentially Steiner Studio coming in there and the park. There's just collision of um, trucks parking there, 
truck routes, but also going to be a pretty big increase in foot traffic there. So I don't know if there is um, a plan to revisit truck routes or um, how that plays in with the waterfront development that's happening and also how that plays in with all these other low emission initiatives and the Third Avenue redesign. Just sorry for the record before you step down. Could you just let us know your name and your affiliation? Or yeah, uh, my name is Belle Stone. Um, I am a community member here. I've lived here for ten years. So. Thank you. I know DOT is revisiting its truck routes, and it has been in I think a couple of decades. Um, so that's one thing that's happening. Um, this plan, Plan YC, and any any of the any of the plans that we do are are created in conjunction with all the city agencies. So we try to find these kind of areas where, where there is connection. Um, there wasn't anything specific related between truck route changes and the low emission zones. I think our approach was really to look at where are communities that are being affected by bad air quality and where would essentially benefit from a low emission zone if that's the route we decide to go. Um, I'm gonna move to uh, the close of this part of the presentation. Um, just because we have more agenda items. So there's, um, I didn't, maybe, maybe I didn't hear it as a question. I heard Gambino more as a statement, but I, what I can do is paraphrase what I think I, what I think you, um, were saying, and then I can go to the public question was just around this question of, um, the electrification of everything. Um, and how are we tackling that at the same time of thinking about issues of security? So if you want to uh, respond to that in your context um, and and back up, yeah. And then and then we'll go to the public question. And then I'll I'll move to uh, close this section. Um, I don't have a response on cybersecurity, and but I understand the concern around we're electrifying and are we more vulnerable or susceptible to to those type of attacks. Um, I can look and to see if there if I have an answer somewhere else. But but yeah, we we don't work on cybersecurity, but I understand uh your question. Oh yeah. I think that's a you know a great question and an important one to think about as we green our grid, how we're gonna make sure power is delivered safely through whether natural disasters or man-made. Um, I think two things come to mind. One, you know, all of our power is currently delivered through an electric grid, which itself, you know, I think is vulnerable in various ways. The thing I will say about a lot of the new green technology is like we're onshoring a lot of our energy production. And in many ways, it makes us more self-sufficient if we have wind turbines offshore that we have control over, you know, that's very much something that we actually, with a lot of the green energy, solar, wind, um, you know, what have you, these are things that we'll have full control over. And in many ways, we're actually diversifying away from fossil fuels, which a lot of foreign actors control versus moving to a much greener technology, which we also control much more tightly. Um, and, you know, I think it's a good question, but I, I did want to respond with that. question and then Angela Azzolino, uh you can unmute yourself hello can you hear me we can yeah thank you for the meeting just before we uh, move on I did have two questions uh for the representatives for the city and uh one is you mentioned a lot about training of electrical vehicles can you tell us what that training consists of and what agencies will be conducting the trainings uh, for the for the electrified fleets. And then I'll just, in the interest of time, go ahead and say the second question, which is that we know um, electric vehicles weigh much heavier than traditional vehicles, on average 33% more in weight, which causes um, increases in particulate matter, right? So the small matter that gets into our lungs and in communities like like ours where there are um, high numbers of cardiovascular disease um, and asthma and other respiratory concerns in the neighborhoods, 
by Gowers and others, um, I'm interested in knowing how is the city or what is the city doing to monitor increases in particulate manner as the city fleets go electric. I would say with the, with their training, we're still in the very early stages of exploring what are possible funding options and then what partner agencies we would work with. So, you know, the mayor's office of talent, uh, SBS, things like that. Uh, also some partnerships with like MTA around electrification and on the school bus uh, aspect, partnering with uh, vendors like Nice Bus uh, to help kind of develop some of that training. The training involves kind of a bit of like the fleet management, but also just like the mechanics of an electric vehicle and just being able to safely essentially make any changes that are needed. Um, and then in terms of air quality monitoring, I would point to our uh, community health uh, air quality survey that DOHMH, the Department of Health and Mental Services uh, has. I think that's our, our main go-to when, when it comes to, to measuring air quality. And we had a presentation at some point in October. Um, it was a joint presentation committee meeting with transportation and the environmental um, committee for CB7, where we learned about the state and city air quality study that's been happening over a year. And then there are several organizations, um, the New York Environmental Justice Alliance, UPROSE, Neighbors Helping Neighbors, who have access to this data. And so there was a presentation uh, specifically the ACLIMA data, there was a present a short presentation from Neighbors Helping Neighbors on showing how Sunset Park in particular by way of the ACLIMA study in comparison to the other places has, high the, has the highest concentration of PM 2.5. So it was kind of underscoring any of these proposals around BQE or Third Avenue that we actually have from a city state sponsored level study over the last year, which is very recent, that we are one of the most impacted. So when we're looking at solutions that are being proposed by the city and the state, we want to see how those are going to actually address the air quality concerns. Um, so I appreciate Angela's question. So thank you to Jessica um, for coming. We want you to come back uh, and we want to be able to work with you on a lot of the, uh, some of the ideas I think that were being raised today around how are you gonna engage industrial business zones? We are one. Um, how are you gonna engage around thinking about accessing the waterfront? We have one um, and looking at the potential of a low emission zone. Um, and I think that you know Sunset Park has, and Windsor Terrace Community Board 7 has been working on this and desperately looking for solutions in action. So uh, please come back and um, work in partnership. So thank you so much. And Emily. Thank you. Um, so we're gonna shift to uh, the second half of the agenda, which is to um, give ourselves time. I'm just gonna kind of explain what we're about to do and then um, before we do it. So there will be time for public comment um, and specifically on the Third Avenue proposals. That was the meeting that happened in, um, they basically happened in the same week and a half. So the Third Avenue proposal in early November, and then there were public meetings for BQE, uh, which included BQE South, virtual and in-person, the week of the sixth. Um, if there are still presentations outside, you can get paper copies. They were sent out to committee members. So we'll do public comment. Um, there might be people in the room from the public who wanna comment. Um, and then there uh, might be people virtually. We would ask you as a public member to take three minutes. That's usually the time we leave for public comment. And then what we'll do is move into um, uh, small groups. Um, then I'm going to ask the committee members um, and public uh, to basically kind of physically move themselves um, into groups of three people. If you're an agency rep, you can stay, but I'm just basically asking the committee members can and the public can, can sit together. And then we're going to take about uh, 10 to 15 minutes in these small groups and the, the prompts are the ones that I had shared, which is just like, what did, what did you see that you like that is working? What are some of the things that are missing? And then we're gonna come back. That is gonna in, inform um, Community Board 7, uh, allowing us to put together some of our questions and our comments that we wanna provide back both to the BQE proposal and as well as the city. There was a meeting a week and a half, no, 
week and a half before Thanksgiving um, with the community-based organizations that served as outreach partners. Uh, we did talk about this, uh, that there was a intention to get the organizations who did outreach for the BQE work and for Third Avenue to get their reactions. Um, I would say overwhelmingly, we heard that they're, they were not satisfied with the proposals that came in. They're providing their own direct feedback um, to BQE and DOT, but Community Board 7 also has a responsibility to be on the record um, and report back and also talk about what we want to see, that we didn't see, and what we like. So I'm moving to public comment, and then we'll move into small groups. Um, and our meeting, the goal is that our meeting will end by 8. So I just want to kind of give you a sense of the, the timing, if not earlier. Um, so public comment on BQE Third Avenue. Do we have anybody virtually who's raised their hand? Oh, yeah. Do you want to grab the mic? Just the thank you. And I'm sorry, when we went around the room, we didn't introduce you. So yeah, yeah, go for it. Okay. Um, yeah. So we have Emily from City DOT who's here and then Alicia. Hi, everyone. My name is Alicia Posner. I'm the Deputy Director of Safety Projects and Programs at the Department of Transportation. Um, thank you for being here. I recognize some of you from our earlier uh, Third Avenue engagement. Um, I do just want to emphasize as you're making your comments and having your discussions, um, I'm here representing the group who is working on the Third Avenue Street Improvement Project. Then there is also the BQE uh, visioning effort, which is, I realize, going on at the same time and covering a lot of the same areas. So I totally understand why they're being um, discussed together by this committee. But I really want to encourage you um, to give us your feedback on the Third Avenue Street Improvement Project concept specifically, because we are really looking forward to uh, we want to move forward with something in the next year and we want to be able to come back to the board and the committee with a more fleshed out proposal um, in the spring, 20, spring, summer 2024. Um, so we're really hoping to get um, as much feedback as possible about the concepts that we presented um, with an eye to what is actually in the DOT toolkit for in-house work which includes uh, marking, signal work, curb regulations, um, changes in lane configurations, bike lanes, bus lanes, et cetera, um, does not include larger changes, which require moving utilities, moving drainage, or other things that would be considered capital work. Um, so just want to encourage you um, to make the best use of that time um, there. But obviously, I'm sure you have a lot of comments about the overall BQE visioning process, um, which just emphasize um, that, you know, I'm not in charge of that process. I'm happy to take those comments back, but most of those is for visioning more of a medium to long term um, things for Third Avenue and could uh, presumably be folded into capital efforts in the future on Third Avenue. So thank you. Prompt, thank you. For opening with that. Okay, so we'll move to public comment. Um, if there's anybody virtually who has public comment on Third Avenue or BQE, nothing yet. Okay, is there anyone public comment? Um, we're going to move to the committee discussion, but yeah. Okay, yeah. How you doing, Eric Frankel? How many of you live on Third Avenue or work on Third Avenue or was conceived on Third Avenue? I was. My father said I was conceived in the store, but he was out getting a sandwich. But uh, we've been there 130 years. We supply the uh, industry with work clothes, work shoes. So we're actually in the industrial section. They charge us to park till 10 p.m. You know, this is a poor block. I say we have cars to get to work, not to drive to our second home in the Hamptons. It's it's expensive. The taxes are crazy and the air is polluted. You know, it's, I don't understand why they can't just take down the BQE and build a tunnel. I joke, I say we had El Chapo in the prison down the block because they know Third Avenue is the one place in the world they can't build a tunnel. It's crazy. And actually my, my great uncle helped design it. 
And my, my, uh, my father said, why do you do such a shitty job? And he said, if we did a good job, there'd be no work for us now. That the money that they make off the repairing, you need to take it down, just build the tunnel. And that's all I have to say. Thank you. Eric. Um, okay, I'm just looking around the room. Any other public comment? Okay. Okay, great. Um, so with that, I'm going to give, uh, if you are a committee member um, or a member of the public, um, I'm going to put you all together basically until uh, 740, 745, depending on how the discussion is going. Um, just ask one person to take notes so we can report back, but just what what is in, so let's start with Third Avenue proposal. Um, what's in there? What do you have additional questions about? What do you like? What do you not like? Um, and then we'll come back and report back. So try something new. Hope you all can work with me. <laughs> okay. So maybe I can help facilitate if needed. You guys don't have to be in the group, right? Exactly. So if you're a city rep. Well, I wanted to, they're physically finding each other. So, Damien, Jason, Jerry, and Ben. The three of you guys. Yeah, that's good. Okay. Um, and then, so the four of them, it looks like, are grouping. And then do you. Okay. There's a reporter, Meg Bengal, and then some of the, uh, the neighbors. Okay. Okay, John. John is getting in the back because then you can help facilitate the. Okay, and then who's who's the one? Yes, yes, okay. And do we have, I'm going to ask them. Um, have we ever reviewed Okay, I'm going to ask them to show. So, there are other 
It's very possible I just don't recall it. So you you brought up you brought up quick implementation. Fourth Avenue doesn't have those issues. It's five and a half years and it's still incomplete. So the city doesn't do quick implementation. Why you started with the middle section in our district rather than look at the worst uh, intersection to start there? Well, 60, 65th, uh, or no, 60th, I, I'm sorry, it would be the worst. 
I, I, I get that. Um, but really more like what all these bygone laws are best for the result of what we thought that came in. So that 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 seems backwards to me. Wouldn't you want to improve <laughs> the most dangerous intersection and then base everything else off of that rather than base what you do at the most dangerous one from what you do everywhere else? Looking at it as a corridor in and of itself, which is something that the four roads have to think about is what the structure of the road is going to actually lay out in the corridor. So even if it leaves 60th Street as an extremely dangerous intersection? Well, I mean, like, uh, frankly, we have to think about something that we can do that brings us to having to do something like the school is maxed out and it needs to be built up on the new school now. So if we want to make some changes to the old one, like not the city, we can want to do it in the old one. Yeah. That old one is the same, but it's not a Step out of the room. Could you tell us what you said? Mm -hmm. In our session, they don't touch the BQ. Right. It's not, in our case, that's not what's up. It's a little bit of a little thing. It's obviously a thing. It's a little bit of a I would prefer without He's bringing us our <laughs> okay, so uh, we just hit the 745 mark. Um, and I'm going to ask um, John DeLuper, who's our vice chair, uh, is also our minutes taker. So I appreciate uh, him doing that. 
Um, so I'm just going to ask if there's one person from the group, um, maybe somebody who hasn't spoken a lot yet. So if there's one person from the group who hasn't spoken a lot, they can report out. Or if you made someone in charge of reporting out, they can just report out. Um, and then you can just use the mic up front and we will take these notes um, into report back. And if there's additional questions that came up. So we'll do Sam first and then go ahead. Um, and then we'll go to John's group and then we'll go to Damien. Um, and the folks who joined virtually, uh, you can send your comments through the chat. We'll make sure we capture those. And if you didn't have a chance yet, um, you can send it. Um, I should just actually say this now. Um, anybody who is listening virtually and you want to be able to send through your comments, the Brooklyn Community Board 7 email is... Um, I'll put it in the chat, but it's bk07 at cb.nyc.gov. So if you have public comment that you didn't have a chance to add um, and and additional thoughts as a committee member um, on the Third Avenue proposal and, and BQE, please send it that way. Okay. Um, they should send their comments by uh, Monday of next week um, by the end of the day. So it's December 18th. So in a week. Okay. Thank you, Sam. Hi. Good evening again. I'll I'll be uh, brief. Mm -hmm. First of all, it's a lot a lot to dissect uh, uh, in those few minutes that uh, we got together. But uh, the thing that jumped out at us uh, is the issue of pedestrian safety, uh, specifically the time that it takes folks to get from one side of Third Avenue to the other. Um, we feel that this particular issue is uh, low-hanging fruit it's something that could be addressed immediately with what we have. How? Um, short term, we can look at perhaps longer longer traffic lights or something, I'm just making this up, safety timing by uh, uh, streets where you have hospitals or schools, let's say along Third Avenue, those lights at those intersections can perhaps be a little longer than normal. Um, those are short-term goals that we're looking at. Long-term goals, where you know, we can do like uh, extend the sidewalks, um, make markings on the floor for for the vehicles to know uh, uh, what's ahead or where they have to turn for whatever parking space, whatever it may be. We feel that these things are are easy fixes. Uh, again, I say the term low-hanging fruit, and that is my brief report. And thank you for the time. Sam. Um, okay, we'll go to John's group. Are you the person reporting out? Okay. All right. So reporting out from our group, we had a bunch of discussion about how a lot of the issues related to Third Avenue do come out of the BQE and its presence. Um, there's We also had some discussion about how solving that, you know, kind of can help with some of the other issues. We did have discussions also on parking. We were a little mixed. There was some uh, discussion about uh, changing that, but there was also some people who said that that was maybe not as high a priority. So that's something that ha that was, you know, something people had multiple opinions on. Um, there was talk about option three seeming preferable and options like limiting lanes and adding a bike lane being potential of that low hanging fruit, like Sam mentioned. Um, there was also concerns about increased uh, foot traffic from pedestrians, especially as the neighborhood changes, especially uh, as there are more residential uses uh, in the area and things like urban air and schools, which are bringing a lot of, uh, you know, children and, and th uses that are not those industrial uses. So there was talk about how we can do things like uh, possibly raised crosswalks or curb extensions to help keep those pedestrians safe in this new area. Uh, that said, like the BQE issues, the issues of zoning are also long-term things about how to use the neighborhood. And that is something that we talked about facilitate or discussing in this type of, uh, in our group. Um, we'll go there. So with my group, it was me, Jerry Jones, and also Emily. Um, some of the pros that we discussed was like um, from the project was the removal of cobblestones under the guanas. It would help with people with disabilities so they could have smooth walkway, especially not with people with disabilities, but also 
families with carriages and etc um another uh pro was like we kind of like it was small talks with option three as well um but majority of our conversations is more of the cons so the cons part was the school along third avenue haven't provided for safety especially on 60th street 61st and third first as a board beca um became before the school started construction um i from Jones, it was the talk that the board was trying to advocate for more safety, and that still hasn't been met. Um, that they want to address the community board. Oh, how crosswalks are scary. Um, and also we were talking about like the bike line safe. Um, that even if we put a bike line, uh, on Third Avenue, like how can we make it even more safer? Like I, we understand that there will be like park like the cars will be parked uh, between the bike lane and the drive. But like, how can we really make that more safer to make sure that cars don't really drive on the bike lane? And that's all. Extending this uh, beyond 62nd Street. Oh yes, extending yeah. beyond this. To the edge of uh, Community Board 7, which is... Um, great, thank you. Well, thanks to John for getting that um, in the minutes and then also recording it. Uh, we do want to invite anyone who joined in the room or joined virtually to send your additional comments to um, the community board. We have a meeting next week, uh, the full community board, seven. Um, we will be on December 20th. Um, it'll be here in the office at 630. Um, we will be reporting out from this meeting and talking about some of the issues. Uh, we did hear Alicia from DOT talking about they are looking for our comments and they are looking for our feedback um, through a plan for implementation in the spring. So um, this is not the last time we're going to be talking about this as a committee. Um, when we come back in January, we want to be able to report back and figure out what our next step is. Um, but so be thinking about it. Um, and uh, before I close, it looks like we have a hand up in the room. So I'll just go to do, do, do Mike, yeah. just so you have that. I just wanted to briefly address a couple of the questions that were brought up um, and also just add one more thing um, regarding uh, 60th Street and the area where are the schools. I know there was discussion about that um, at the last committee meeting where we made the presentation. When we do come back to the board with a full fresh, uh, flesh out proposal, we do intend to include a proposal for that area. We know very well it is the most dangerous intersection on the corridor. Um, but we felt that we needed to develop um, a proposal, like set the template for the cross section for what the majority of the corridor is, which is 54th um, to up to prospects 19th, um, depending on where you count from. Um, so that is why for this uh, concept section, um, we are not including those, but we do intend to include that in the entire proposal, um, the full proposal. Um, and regarding bike lane hardening, um, if we do go with option three, um, we would be pursuing, um, in addition to um, parking protected bike lane, other areas of hardening. Um, and I think, again, when we come back with a full proposal, if that's the option that we go with, we would provide more details about um, what we would be pursuing there. Um, and the last thing I want to say is um, definitely looking forward to more robust discussion. Um, I do just want to keep timeline in mind. We are looking to come back to the board um, with a full flushed out proposal in spring, summer 2024. Um, but we will need time, like once we decide the option that we pursue to um, finish a traffic study, obviously finish design, um, have more discussions with the MTA, um, because I know with option three, we discussed um, the possibility of bus boarding islands and concrete pedestrian islands um, in some locations. So there will be a lot of coordination that needs to go on around that. Um, so I just want to keep that timeline in mind um, if we do intend to come back and present in the spring to just you know keep those uh, expectations realistic. Um, and that's all. When there's a backup 
an accident or whatever on the Gowanus. All the cars are on 3rd Avenue, 4th Avenue, 5th Avenue. A bike lane, nothing against the bike lane, but you, you take another lane away from 3rd Avenue, the backup is going to triple. And what about emissions? We all are talking tonight about emissions. What happens when there's a backup? Keep that in mind, please. Uh, thank you for that. I am going to close out. Um, thank everybody for your participation. Please come to the community board meeting uh, next week on the 20th. And thanks so much for joining. All right. Thank you.